Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kelly D'Amico and I'm a marketing specialist at Threat Connect. I'm going to take a few minutes to go over some housekeeping items and the agenda and then I'll introduce today's speaker. First, I want to let you know that everyone's phone lines are muted to keep background noise to a minimum. If you have questions, please ask them by typing into the chat feature on your webinar console. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar. Second, the webinar is being recorded today. We will send out the recording as soon as we have it available. Now for the agenda. Today we're going to review how indicators are key to an intelligence-driven security automation strategy. We'll end with a Q&A. Now I'll introduce today's speaker. Drew Gidwani is the Director of Analytics at Threat Connect. He drives the data modeling, collection, and analytics both within the core Threat Connect platform and in Cal. Previously, Drew worked for the Department of Defense where he leveraged his varied analysis analysis experiences to scale growing intelligence teams in the face of ever-changing threats we face today. Drew holds a BS from Carnegie Mellon University and an MS from Johns Hopkins University. He currently resides in Maryland with his fierce warrior dog named Gimli. So now that's it for me. I'll turn it over to Drew. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, if we can flip the screen share over to me, I can get the slide deck up and running. Hopefully you guys can see my screen there. It looks like we should be good to go. Thank you for that introduction, Kelly. Uh, as mentioned, I am Drew Gidwani. I'm the Director of Analytics here at Threat Connect. Uh, and we're going to have a little bit of fun today, or at least I think it's fun. Uh, I like to geek out on math and trying to model things, so uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as I do. Just a quick little bit about me. Uh, that's me on the left. I'm a self-proclaimed donut connoisseur. I call myself that not because I'm a snob about donuts. I just can't say that I love donuts really on slides usually. Uh, I've been at Threat Connect for about four and a half years. I've done all sorts of jobs here. I've done sales, I've done development, QA, uh, and I ran our customer success team for about two years. Uh, and as mentioned, I'm a, I'm a dog person. That's my dog at the bottom right, Gimli. He's really great. I apologize if you guys hear him at any point during this broadcast. All right, <clears throat> so before we really get into the meat and potatoes of today's talk, uh, I wanted to kind of like lay out the framework and the agenda for you guys. And the first thing is for us to frame the problem. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting that as we've gotten way better about intelligence as an industry, you know, indicators still kind of remain an unsolved problem for a lot of us. And I think like anything else, there's sort of shades of gray and how we can go about addressing that problem. Uh, but I, I think it's worth having a checkpoint, right, about why they still matter and some of the challenges associated with them. And more specifically, why reputation of indicators is very important. The other thing that we're going to get into from there is sort of how to measure indicator reputation, right? What does it actually represent in terms of risk and what are some of the components in that and how do you scale that uh, as you kind of model and compute those things over time? And then we're gonna get our hands dirty a little bit. We're gonna take some of the stuff that we've covered, some of the lessons learned, and we're actually going to try to design a, a solution, right? We're gonna outline what we think makes for a good indicator reputation solution. Uh, we have some example work that we've got and we'll actually sort of poke holes in some things and identify what we do well in some of these models and where there's room for improvement. All right, so starting with the problem, always the first thing to talk about. And I think that we've all thought to ourselves like, wow, life was way easier when we could just block domains like bad.com or whatever. I think that if you saw our earlier webinar, uh, I think it was sometime last year in 2018 about taking data and turning it into intelligence, there's this idea of kind of promoting things, right? A, a bit of data is just a raw fact. It's something that maybe you get out of a log file as an artifact or something. But as you model context on it, it becomes information. And when you have patterns of information, you actually kind of know something. And when you can use that knowledge to predict things and, and get insights from them, uh, then you've kind of promoted yourself into intelligence. And analytics are a great way to kind of move up that maturity curve. I think one of the most important things that we can do when we talk about uh, moving something from data to intelligence is, is understand what we need to be collecting and why, so that we can shift from a, a kind of reactive standpoint to a proactive standpoint. And indicators are always, unfortunately, I think, going to be kind of one of the key elements of that. They're an atomic building block. That's the name of the webinar. Uh, you know, that past data, if we are properly properly curating it, uh, we can actually move it up the curve and make it intelligence. And that, that can help us be more proactive instead of reactive. And so I will continue to contend throughout this webinar that Indicators are necessary, but maybe not the only ingredient when it comes to having a healthy security posture. So now let's talk about the challenge of indicators a little bit. Uh, anybody who has looked at this graphic on the right 
which I did not make. It's called the Pyramid of Pain, and the link is there if you ever want to read the full blog post on it. Uh, but if you're familiar with this, you know exactly what I'm about to get into, which is that indicators can be very easy to change. This pyramid represents sort of the, the level of difficulty associated for an adversary to, to kind of change some part of their, their attack posture. If you look all the way at the bottom, that's when things are the easiest. You can change a file hash by padding a string, you know, add a couple bits and suddenly you have a completely different file hash. That means that us actually tracking file hashes has a lot of problems associated with it, right? Because they're very fluid. As you move up the pyramid, you get into things like IP addresses, domain names, you know, I can turn off my Amazon EC2 server, turn it right back on, they'll provision a new IP address. Not that difficult. Domain names, it's not rocket science, but it's starting to get kind of annoying. And as you move up, the whole reason we want to get to the top of the pyramid from a defense standpoint is because those TTPs and those tools are difficult to change. This is why we want to promote indicators up that curve that I mentioned on the last slide and get into intelligence. Now, there are challenges by the fact that we're working mostly on the bottom part of the pyramid. Like I mentioned, they're easier to change. Uh, if we're dealing with like watch lists or blacklists, open source feeds, premium feeds, generally we're looking at kind of a reactive list of indicators, right? Indicators that have been observed, they've been analyzed, identified, and kind of labeled and classified for us so that we know that they're bad. That kind of carves into the actionable shelf life of an indicator. There could be billions of these flying around your network at any given time. Depending on how big your enterprise is, you've got a huge scale problem that you've got to worry about. But at the end of the day, the actual evaluation of these indicators is always going to be a stable, a stable to making sure that we have intelligence driven operations, right? Both sides of the fence need to be able to play with indicators and know what they're working with. So we know about indicators and why they're important. I think it's really worth talking about the, the actual reputation element of it. There's a few problems that we can solve by having a good indicator reputation model so that when an alert fires or when you've got a whole list of things to go through, you kind of know what you need to do and why. The first set of problems I think is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, it's simply triage, right? If you've got thousands of alerts popping and you want to know which ones to start with, which ones are just garbage, you know, whether your operations or Intel side, it's really important to be able to rack and stack those appropriately, right? If you're wasting a lot of time on things that end up being false positives, then you're really not using your resources effectively. Uh, analyst fatigue is a real problem. And as that fatigue builds up, you're actually more likely to either miss or just not get around to something that's actually a, a critical event, something that's gonna be impactful to your organization. If you do find something that's gonna be impactful to your organization, a good indicator reputation system will help you kind of understand what to do with it next, right? It's gonna help you say that I need to escalate to this tier of service. We need to start ripping servers out of the racks or shutting down laptops. How do we detect any of the adjacent things that we need to look for? How do we mitigate you know, the specific impact that we're looking at? Uh, all of those things can be tightened up a lot more when you understand the nature of the indicator that tipped you off in the first place. And then finally, you know, we talked about promoting things up that curve. If we're doing a really good job with our indicator reputation, what we're doing is we're building those additional bits of context surrounding indicators so that it's not just a raw IP address in a log file. Any of those little fields or attributes that we can start to glue onto the sides of it help us promote some of that raw data into intelligence that helps us learn and helps us be way more proactive so that we're not just waiting to get popped by the same IP address that we saw on a blacklist. All right, so hopefully I've told you guys, if you're still here, on the importance of measuring the, uh, the reputation of an indicator. Like, let's get into some of the actual nuts and bolts of it. Uh, and, you know, kind of what, what's in a host name here? So you guys are going to see some, some fun memes over the next few slides. Um, so what is indicator reputation? And if you're anything like me, you, you've had at some point in your mind, uh, this guy on the right who just like looks at a Boolean, like, yes, no, true, false flag. Like, does, is, is this a good enough rating system? Uh, and the answer is no, and, and I've tried it in past lives and it doesn't work out well because we're really trying to model more than just good or bad. It needs to represent the risk to your organization. Uh, and if you look below the meme, we've got kind of the risk formula. It's a function of impact and probability, and you can even factor in the cost. Now, this is gonna get kind of hairy and we're gonna see in the next few slides why this can snowball on you, but uh, let's just start by saying that all three of those elements cannot always be considered to be straightforward. They can be difficult to collect, they can be difficult to measure, difficult to estimate. Uh, and on top of that, some of those 
those influencing factors, um, they may be globally true across the board and others are gonna need to be kind of tailored to your organization. So let's get into what that means. Uh, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but I'm trying to paint the picture for you guys of all the different variables that uh, may kind of come in and out of your radar when you're looking at how to build an indicator reputation measurement system. The first thing that we talked about was impact. Uh, and I think one of the most common ones that we talk about is sort of the phase of the intrusion, right? There's a difference between me getting scanned by an IP address and me exfilling tens of gigabytes of data to an IP address or uh, me observing command and control or C2 traffic between one of my assets and an IP address. So knowing if you are pre or post breach is actually one of the biggest gauges of impact that you can tie to an indicator. I think it's also worth talking about the adversary, sort of who is behind whatever uh, activity this indicator is, is associated to. Uh, and you've got to con consider a couple dimensions there. There's the sophistication of the adversary. So there's a difference between, you know, is it a nation state actor or is it a hacker for hire that just took something right off the shelf? Um, and then even the intent, right? That might be something that's highly dependent on your organization and your industry. If I am Drew and I run Drewloo streaming services, uh, then maybe I care a lot more about uptime and denial of service and making sure that I can actually give my service to my customers. Uh, whereas if somebody is trying to get actual encrypted content off of my CDN network with video files lift, that's really not the end of the world. Uh, conversely, if I run uh, you know, an aeronautical industry and my intellectual property is my lifeblood and I have top secret fighter jet plans, uh, then maybe I actually care way more about information being exfilled than I would about uptime or availability. You've also got to consider something like the target value. Uh, going back to my Drulu streaming site example, there's a difference between uh, somebody knocking over a server or a database that has a whole bunch of stuff in it with customer payment details uh, versus maybe you know customer preferences and the models that we use for machine learning to recommend you know which episode of Friends you should be watching next. If we shift to the right a little bit, probability is where, in my mind, from a math standpoint, things get a little more fun but a lot more chaotic. <laughs> Um, we talked about fluidity, and if you think about the pyramid of pain, you really do have to think about the types of indicators that you're looking at and sort of that shelf life that we talked about. And fluidity and timeliness, I think, are pretty much related in that if you're looking at an IP address that was reported four years ago, uh, who knows what that IP address is now? And it's going to be a little bit different for domain names, different for file hashes, uh, but you do need to consider you know, the likelihood based on the age of the intel that you're working with that it's actually going to impact you. You've got to consider the trustworthiness of your sources. Um, if you're like us or our customers, we see you know, people that have open source intelligence feeds coming in. Maybe they're paying for some feeds. Uh, their own internal devices and teams are producing some good raw feeds that they can work with. You know, they might actually be collaborating with other uh, industry partners or ISACs in their community. And I think we've all had that problem where you can't always take some of that stuff at face value, right? So you, you wanna find a way to model the fact that uh, maybe you don't trust every single one of those exactly the same amount. That being said, there is something to be said for corroboration. Uh, maybe you don't trust every one of those five sources the same, but if you're hearing something and it's something similar across five sources, that in and of itself is like a nice uh, boost to your confidence that you know the, the probability of this indicator having some impact on your organization should be so high. Uh, and then at the end of the day, there's also relevance, right? Uh, it could be that there's something really obviously bad happening, uh, but maybe it doesn't actually impact you because it's not something that targets your industry. If I'm running a streaming service, I don't know that I'm as worried about somebody that's going after industrial control systems in the Middle East. Or uh, it might be that there is a bug in WordPress that somebody is trying to exploit. And I know that we don't have WordPress as a CMS in any of our tech stacks. So like, yeah, maybe that scan and that attempted exploit is itself bad, but it's not relevant to me. So the probability that it would be a high risk play for us is a lot lower. And then the, the third category of cost, I think, is kind of nebulous. And I think as an industry, we're getting better about starting to measure some of these things. Uh, there's, as I'm sure you guys always have to justify, kind of a cost associated with doing everything, or as we'll see in a little bit with, with not doing certain things. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that there is you know, a cost of detection. Does it take time to reach out across a million laptops in your enterprise and figure out who has this and when? Uh, and how disruptive is that to business processes? And that happens with mitigation too. If I have to start ripping servers out of racks and I'm no longer streaming data 
uh, to any of my streaming customers, then that's a real problem in terms of mitigation if it's going to take me a week to re-image all these servers and everything. I do want to point out these last two categories uh, are maybe a little bit further out there, but I think that it's it's worth keeping in the back of your mind. Uh, the opportunity cost, right? There's a, there's a cost to not doing something else. And if you're heads down and you're dealing with a breach or an investigation that you think might not actually have a huge impact, then you may be missing the ability to detect or mitigate other things. And that itself can be a bit of a problem. And finally, the cost of doing nothing, I think, is... Uh, it, it's a little pithy, but I like to put it out there as sort of, you know, but maybe we did ignore that WordPress scan from before, and then I kind of forgot that we have some legacy site with WordPress. Uh, if something like that blows up in your face, then you've got to worry about, uh, I'm the guy that said, no, we're going to skip that and do nothing with it. But there are opportunities to learn from that when we talk about promoting up the intelligence curve. We'll get into that in a little bit. All right. So before we get any further, <laughs> I want to talk about complicating matters a little bit. Um, if you guys are familiar at all with the Drake equation, it's this equation at the top right here. Uh, and it's it's one of my favorite things because I feel like it's just like a thing a guy came up with on a whiteboard, but probably before whiteboards were invented. And the idea is that you could kind of ballpark the number of advanced civilizations, like alien life in the galaxy that we could make contact with. And really what this guy did was rack and stack a whole bunch of coefficients together. Like, well, how many stars are in the galaxy and how many of them have planets and uh, how many of them have planets that could suit life and so on and so forth. And things get like, you know, less and less likely as you're anding these conditions together. And we kind of have to do that with our indicator reputation stuff, right? We have to think about this vast sea of stars or indicators flying around in our network and then think about the ways that we can chop them down into something that we care about. And so you end up with just coefficients everywhere. Um, I mentioned before you may have multiple sources. That means that each source might have different trust levels, and that might not just be on the indicator itself, but maybe some of the context surrounding the indicator itself. Uh, some things are true for everyone, right? If that IP address is four years old, it's probably not reliable. Uh, some things are true just for your organization and are a little bit more bespoke. So uh, in my streaming example, like maybe the DDoS attack, the denial of service is way scarier than some kind of data exfiltration. And some things are even threat specific, right? If I know that uh, a particular malware family changes its command and control infrastructure every 48 hours, then the shelf life of those indicators, maybe after deciding that host should be good for seven days or 30 days, I have to cut that down to two for this specific kind of threat or anything associated with this threat. And, and that kind of makes matters a little hairier. So before we get into some of the actual application of this stuff, I do wanna talk about scaling. Uh, it's, it's, it exists on like all levels, basically, that this becomes a problem, right? So I'm, I've been mentioning this whole time that we've got so many indicators that we've got to worry about. Even if you come up with a great system, you know, and, and you whiteboard it out and you go one step beyond the Drake equation, uh, you've got to actually kind of calculate that, right? That takes time. That takes expertise. And there's a lot of platforms and tools out there that will help you kind of automate that. But somebody's got to be responsible for owning that automation, right? Who builds the playbooks? Who owns the playbooks? Uh, who's responsible for kind of reevaluating that stuff? Uh, and then there's, you know, a prioritization question, right? When we look at all of the possible inputs into an equation, uh, you got to ask yourself, like, where do I start? Because some of these things are going to have diminishing returns on them. And it can be really overwhelming. Uh, and that's why I have this meme on the right with the two Kermits, right? I think a lot of us start as the good Kermit and say, you know what, I want to be methodical about this and I'm going to whiteboard some stuff out and we're going to do a really good job of it. And then you get into this and by the time you get your hands dirty, you turn into the evil Kermit on the right and you're like, you know what, let's just jam everything into the sim and then we'll figure it out on the back end. Uh, and what we found is that that really doesn't work well for anybody and then we all get kind of grumpy. All right, so now the fun part, or at least to me, I think this is the fun part. Uh, one score to rule them all. Let's find some some solution ideas of like how you guys can actually try to tackle this problem when it comes to your organization. And first, I think it's worth talking about like the, the elements that make for a really good indicator reputation system. The first thing is that it absolutely has to be configurable, right? We've talked about why you might want to tailor something to your organization or your, your industry. Uh, what are your specific priorities, right? Because impact is something that varies from one organization to another. And even if you sit down and whiteboard it out and you nail it the first time around, A, let me know and I'll hire you. And B, I got to tell you, 
a month from now or a year from now, your priorities are going to change. The threat space changes, your, your surface area, your posture, all those things change over time. So you need to be able to update that Drake equation. You need to be able to pull levers and turn dials and say, this coefficient needs to change over here. This cutoff needs to change over there uh, because those things are going to change over time. I think that the, the trust levels is something that is a really quick win for a lot of, of people where uh, if, if I sit down and ask people across their, their security organization, you know, which feeds do you think are good and bad? A lot of people have kind of an inkling and there's a lot of ways to deal or dive into that and, and identify where the bad offenders are and where the reliable ones are. Uh, you want to be able to do that and tweak that. You want to be able to customize what is considered timely. And more importantly, if you're dealing with some kind of corroboration across multiple sources, you want to figure out what successful corroboration looks like. There's also the concept of collaboration, where if you have multiple teams in your organization working together, or you're partnering with somebody else in your industry, you're part of an ISAC, or you've got those fight clubs where you guys are sharing intel around, you want to be able to, to layer all of that in. And that requires, like I said, a lot of dials and levers. The second, I think, key facet of a good indicator reputation system is that it's got to be understandable. Uh, and this means a lot of different things, right? Because you're trying to make something that's understandable by the day one SOC analyst or the day five malware reverse engineering guy or the year 10 threat intel analyst. Uh, and that's just the human side of the equation, right? There's machines like the programmatic consumers of whatever reputation stuff we design that have to make decisions based on our reputation information. Uh, we've got playbooks firing saying if the reputation is above this or below that, do this and that with it. We've got alerts that may fire based on certain things. Uh, reputation may get combined with other things as we're starting to move up that intelligence curve and take a raw indicator and maybe do some attribution on it. So for an understandable reputation measure, uh, I think ideally it should be a scalar value and that is a, you know, a numerical value <clears throat> and it's got to have defined thresholds. Uh, being a scalar value means that you actually get a lot of power in terms of doing some advanced analytics. You know, you can average things, you can uh, kind of decrement reputation over time if you want to age something out. Uh, if you just have sort of three labels like good, bad, I don't know, it's really tough to do some of the advanced use cases that you're going to want to do as you grow up. Uh, now, you can still say that, you know, 60 and above is good or, or bad and 20 and below is good. And I think in the middle is I don't know. It, you need to have those thresholds, but you do need to have an, a number that kind of does the underpinning for you. And I think that people need to be able to see what the inputs are, right? If you're still here on this webinar, you can probably already make peace with the fact that some people like me love doing this stuff and not everybody does, and that's okay. Uh, what we need to do though is kind of crystallize the key inputs and outputs to make sure that when somebody looks at that score and says that it's a 60, they know why I said that. I think we've all used products where we look at a number that gets thrown out there or a happy face or smiley face or whatever emoji they throw out there. And our first question is, okay, what makes you say that? How did you get there? Uh, we don't want people to have to retrace all of the math and you know kind of crunch the numbers themselves, but we just want to know what the highlights are. The third thing that I think makes a indicator reputation solution really good is that it's extensible. So if you think of configurable as the ability to kind of pull the levers and turn the dials, to me, extensibility is your, your ability to add new levers and dials into that Drake equation. How do you, how do you get new, new variables that you've decided are actually really meaningful to you? Uh, can you kind of evaluate how well you're doing? Can you change it? Can you remove the things that aren't actually contributing? Uh, what happens when your priorities change? Does that change your whole model? And when those new elements of risk kind of get surfaced, how are we going to do that? So uh, a good example is like the MITRE attack framework, which has become a big deal. If that's the, a, a new thing that people are using to kind of codify techniques across, you know, different adversaries and across industries and things like that, uh, we need to be able to extend our model to incorporate attack. All right, so let's take a look at sort of a sample model. Um, by no means am I saying that this is the Shangri-La, the be all end all. Uh, but it's something that I think we can talk about for a few minutes and you guys can already start to poke holes in it. Uh, before you read ahead, let's let's kind of walk through this left to right, right? In this example model that we have, um, if you remember the, the three components of risk we said were impact and probability and cost, we're going to say, you know what, this is day one of trying to do indicator reputation modeling. I'm not ready to talk about cost. Let's simplify it and just look at impact and probability. So the first card 
has a series of different categories upon which an indicator can score a certain number of points. Uh, if the TTP severity, if it's something, you know, if, if we've identified that this indicator is using a particular technique uh, and it's something that I really care about, like DDoS in my streaming example, then I will give it a full 20 points. And if I think that the intent is something really severe, maybe it's a competing streaming site that's commissioned this DDoS against me, um, I'm going to give it a full 20 points. And, you know, you get 15 points for sophistication. Maybe it's a brand new way of going about this or, um, you know, maybe the phase of intrusion, this is like leading up to a DDoS, but not quite executing yet. All those things will kind of give you a raw impact score of, in this case, 75 points. Uh, this is how much on a 100 point scale I think I care about this. Now, we do want to layer in another bit of due diligence and look at the likelihood, right, the probability of this. And you can see here that we've added some kind of like multipliers, right, uh, for, for an indicator, like how much can I believe that impact score? These would all be 1.0 if everything looked good, but very few times that actually happens. So you know, maybe the indicator is a little bit older. Maybe I've got some input from, you know, analysts at, a, at a, another organization or another company in my industry. Uh, maybe I don't really trust the source so much where I got it from. So I can multiply all those and come up with kind of my, my confidence rating for this of 0.5 out of one. Uh, and I could multiply those together. And if you look at the top right, Bob's your uncle, we've got a 37.8% score. Now we're gonna get into the strengths and weaknesses of this a little bit. Uh, but one thing that I do wanna highlight is the highlights at the bottom right. So we can pull out things like where, where did this fire, right? Where did it get a lot of points? So that when somebody looks at 37%, you know, maybe this is in conjunction with an alert that looks really bad. It fired based on a signature and a SIM that looks really bad, uh, or it came through a playbook and, and all those things kind of immediately put it on my radar, but I can back it out a little bit once I see, all right, yeah, some of these things do look bad, but it's kind of old and we have some conflicting information. Uh, you can see here if it's 95 days old and if I have 15 false positive votes in my platform, then I know that like maybe this isn't what the playbooks thought it was, Obviously, orchestration and automation aren't perfect. That's why we still have humans in the loop. So let's let's break down what this model does well and maybe not so well. Some strengths and weaknesses, if you will. So the first thing I would say is that I really like the impact section here. I think it's configurable, right? You can change those levers and dials. Uh, if you decide, hey, we got this fancy DDoS protection service that we like, maybe that's not a TTP that scares us as much as it used to. We can say that instead of 20 points for DDoS, you only get 10 points or something. Uh, maybe we decide that the phase of intrusion is actually way more important than the sophistication or the intent. Uh, and, and we can kind of change these category weights around in terms of the denominator of each of those, those fractions. Uh, and of course it's extensible, right? If there's another, a sixth item that we decide that we care about, then we can add that to the list and change the, the math accordingly. The probability section, I think, is where we run into a lot of weaknesses, right? So in my mind, this can be very difficult to balance. Somebody's got to sit down and come up with the acceptable range for, you know, uh, how, how do we age out IOCs and, and like really what, what's even the function for that part? Uh, you know, how much do we care about peer corroboration and those false positive votes? Um, I don't think it's very extensible. If you continue to add more and more things here and you're using a multiplicative model like this, then you're gonna kind of just deflate things over time and eventually nothing may score above 30%. Uh, and then the other thing that I think is a real limitation here, and again, this was designed as a rudimentary model, uh, is that there's no interactions, right? There's something to be said for uh, the age problem existing more for certain TTPs or certain indicator types uh, than for others. Or maybe you need to and a couple of these conditions together. What happens if it's a, a zero day exploit from a nation state? Uh, I, I, I may have a different way of leaning those things in my probability model based on the fact that they're both present at the same time. And right now this is, you know, again, kind of abstracted away, but it doesn't really answer that. I do think that the output is good, right? Especially if you can stick to like percentages or something like that. Um, people understand, right? 37.8%, it's out of 100. You know, you don't have to say that I had 11 out of 17 points because I'm obsessed with prime numbers or something. Uh, I think the fact that it's a scalar numeric range is really powerful. So we can average things together. We can say, you know, across a particular feed, the average score is 46%. 
Um, there's a lot of like next level analytics that can take place and say, you know, all of our bad incidents that we closed out that were confirmed uh, were triggered off of an indicator whose score was 70% or more. We need those scalar numbers, but we still do need the cutoffs there, right? We need to say that above 70%, we're going to open an incident and do X, Y, and Z with it. And below 10%, Maybe you should go off into a false positive queue so that we can kind of reduce some of the noise that we create down the line. And this is part of that that promotion to intelligence so that we can learn from these things as we continue to, to build them out and model them. Uh, I do think that this little model does a good job of showing some of the clear factors, right? Like, where did you get your points from? The fact that I care about the TTP, the fact that I care about the intent. Um, being able to convey the magnitude even of those factors, like three plus signs versus two plus signs is a nice little thing. Uh, but one thing that you do have to be careful of is that there's a lot of information here, right? We are trying to condense what could be thousands of data points down into kind of one number or one number and four lines, or you know, those four lines can turn into 10 lines before you know it. So you've got to be careful about overwhelming people with some of this stuff. So it's probably worth taking a second to explain the way that we do this in the Threat Connect platform. Uh, so we have an algorithm called Threat Assess, and that's what we use for our IOC reputation. Uh, and it checks all the boxes, right? It's configurable. We can normalize all these different data sources. We can weigh them appropriately. We can evaluate them the way that we want to under the hood. Um, I think it's very understandable. You can see here on the right, we have a simple scale of zero to 1,000. We have breakpoints and color coding and you know, above 700, this could be critical, or maybe 750 if, if that's where you want to draw the line and the thing turns red. Um, you can see that there are certain factors that we've pulled through, just like in the pluses and minuses screen, like this was observed recently. Uh, it doesn't have any recent false positives reported, otherwise there would be a checkbox there. And it's really extensible, right? We can handle the aging, uh, the way that observations or network sightings factor into it. Uh, how multiple analysts from different areas and over different periods of time have weighed in and said, yes, I think this is high impact, low probability or low impact, high probability, but maybe the, that analyst is not somebody that I trust super much. Uh, and so you can look kind of at the top right here. We've got reputation sources, all sorts, of, and it could be hundreds of reputation sources, uh, and they can have different weights of how much we trust them we've got that supplemental data that we can layer in and all every single one of those elements can be aged appropriately. So, you know, observations or false positive votes from different sources may have different ages that we want to consider. All that gets rolled into our final number. Now, like I said at the beginning, there's no such thing as a perfect system. You know, we're always looking to grow and adapt, but you can hopefully see that when you have enough data in place and you're storing and modeling it correctly so that you can ask the right questions, you can actually distill a lot of this down and we can do this on the scale of tens of millions of indicators uh, across all of our instances and our collective analytics layer or Cal uh, actually does a good job of doing this for hundreds of millions of indicators uh, so that we can give some baseline indicator reputation scoring. So to wrap up, if you're still here with us, <laughs> if you enjoyed geeking out with me, um, I think that indicator reputation and curation, it's, it's an old problem, right? But it's still relevant. It's still vital. Uh, I think a lot of us still struggle with it. Um, and it's really important to highlight that your, your org's needs are going to change, right? That Drake equation that you put together is, is something that has to change over time as you want to turn those dials and pull those levers. So if that's, if that's always going to be a moving target for us, then your solution, the, like the right model for you is going to change as well. Uh, you can, and believe me, I have, spend way too much time and just go into a bunker and come out 80 days later looking for sunlight and say, I've got it. I've got like the perfect system. Uh, but there's sort of a diminishing return problem there, right? Because it is that moving target. And the, pro the other problem is that, you know, if, if you solve it now, a year from now, that perfect solution probably won't work. So you kind of have to strike the balance of something that's manageable. Right? You can update it, you can look at the dials, you can say, I'm gonna pull these levers and figure out what's good enough because at the end of the day, I don't think any of us want to or should spend our entire time scoring indicators. Right? We need to find ways that we can do that at scale a bit more programmatically. Um, and because this needs to be really fine-tuned to your organization and your needs, I think the takeaway is that IOC reputation isn't one size fits all and we can't really treat it that way. You need to think through what is important to my organization? Because a 600 for me might be a 300 for you. And with that, I think we've got time for questions, hopefully.
Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Drew. Um, we're going to move on to questions. Uh, we've had a couple people come through. Again, if you do have a question, go ahead and submit it on the questions pod at the bottom of the control panel. Um, so first question, how are we supposed to deal with normalizing different reputation systems? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so we had this problem ourselves, and I've spent years of my life trying to help with it. <laughs> Uh, because some some sources won't actually give you any reputation information. So you actually kind of have to derive or infer uh, that if a, a, if a particular feed or provider gave me something, you know, can I map like we did in one of our exercises that it's related to a certain intrusion set and, and kind of derive impact from there. Uh, the other thing that you've got to worry about is some places, this is the hairier problem, some places do give you reputation and it could be on any scale in any form, not always scalar. Uh, so what happens when my sticks feed gives me, you know, a, a label like critical or what happens when this paid feed tells me that it's an 86 out of 94? You've got to find a way to sort of normalize all of that by doing mappings. And it really helps if you have one bucket for everything to land in where you can uh, kind of, I guess, aggregate all that stuff in one place. And you've got a common data model that you can centralize on because then all you're saying is, OK, I want to take that sticks feed and I'll map the critical rating you know, to high impact, which means 80 or 90 out of 100, something like that. Um, you, you can do those mappings. And because you have a stable target at that point, at your point of normalization, it actually allows you to, to work through a lot of the problems that otherwise, uh, you know, frankly, can be untractable. OK, great. Uh, next question, how do you evaluate the trust factor of a source? So the trust factor for, for me has always been a function of like, how much is this going to make me tear my hair out? Uh, I think that we've got a lot of ways of kind of completing a feedback loop. And really from an analytics standpoint or, or a data geek standpoint, like if, if you make a statement about an indicator and I make a decision based on that statement, I need to kind of record, was that the right or wrong decision? Uh, so there's a lot of ways that we do that. And like in Threat Connect, for example, we do have false positive votes where somebody can be like, no, this isn't actually bad. Um, you know, maybe your regex picked up Outlook.com or something like that, uh, which has happened before. And we actually key in on a lot of those false positive votes. And, you know, people can do that from their SIM or whatever other integration. And that's such a huge data point for us because now we can start to tie that back to which feeds have reported certain indicators which have false positives on them. And by doing some fun math whiteboarding stuff, or at least fun to me, uh, we can actually kind of figure out where are the, the culprits, like who are the offenders that are giving indicators that are causing a lot of heartache downstream. Uh, and you can do that, you know, even self-contained, you can look at, you know, where are we creating false positive incidents from, uh, where are we chasing our tails, and which feeds are the ones that are giving us some of those indicators, or which data sources, which signatures are generating those things, so that I can start to tune some of that stuff down. Okay, awesome. Uh, last question, um, how often do you reevaluate your reputation system? Uh, for me, it's daily. <laughs> I like lose sleep over it because it's my job. Uh, but I think the, the correct answer as far as, uh, you know, most, most users or customers should, should be concerned, um, you know, I'd say once a quarter is when we kind of reevaluate those dials, right? Does, does this coefficient need to be at seven? Does this cutoff need to be at 1,000? Uh, and it's it's going to be highly variable based on your data set. But I think if you do it every few months, you get into the habit. Uh, and obviously, you can do it on demand when something blows up in your face because you didn't carry the, the three properly or whatever. Uh, but once a quarter gives you a kind of a snapshot, right? You have enough time to collect data and see how things are performing. It lines up a lot, I think, with most, uh, with most companies and their organizations and, and the way that they do their business schedule. But then I would recommend, if you look at that as kind of a configurability check of that Drake equation once a quarter, I'd say once a year, you need to do that extensibility check, right? Like, are, are we missing things entirely? Like, you know, the things that we have in-house, we're modeling correctly, but what, what do we not even have in-house that we're missing? Uh, and I would say that that annual review of your scoring system kind of helps you identify that. Um, obviously, you've got a lot of products probably in play if you're asking that question. Uh, and, and that's a big part of it, too, is when you look at procurement cycles and things like that, you kind of need to figure out what your inputs are and what is going to be your canonical output so that all of the playbooks, all of the processes and run books and people can kind of level set on the same stable target. Okay, awesome. 
So that is all the time we have for today. Uh, if anyone has any further questions, we'll reach out to you via email. As I said earlier, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send out the final recording as soon as it's available. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Drew, for speaking, and we hope to see you all at the next Thread Connect webinar.